Uh, good afternoon, students. Uh, today we'll be talking about the last of the seven deadly sins, the vice of lust. And uh, before I do that, let's just summarize some of the things that we've done very quickly and see some of the connections between the things that we've done. So remember we started off with a reading on the allegory of the cave and that suggested that for most humans, maybe even all humans, we are satisfied with a very surface level, shadowy level of understanding of the most important matters in all of life. So how many of you have really ever considered uh, thinking hard about the, the nature of sin and uh, or the nature of love and goodness and beauty and... or most of us are just content to go on, you know, uh, and live our day making some money, eating some food, taking showers, um, and, you know, just, just getting through the day, not reflecting, not seeking after extremely uh, vital or important topics. Most of us don't think about questions like, what should be the ultimate purpose of my life or the ultimate goal, the ultimate end that my life is centered around or is aimed towards. Most of us are not reflective along those lines. And the allegory of the cave suggests if that's the case, you're living in a cave, right? You're living in, in, in intellectual, uh, spiritual darkness. And then we so then we decided, so then we went on and looked at the refutation of moral relativism and uh, to, to try to illuminate maybe one topic that has been a bit obscure or a bit in the dark in our own minds, the nature of morality. Is there such a thing as moral truth that transcends our own desires and beliefs? Is there such a thing... Are there such things as moral facts that exist independently of us and our job is to discover them, to hunt after them? Or do we just invent the moral facts and so their existence depends on whatever we believe? So we spent our time looking at that and, and now with the foundation laid, uh, we then decided, right, so we had this foundation of moral absolutism or this... Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we've, we've uncovered this skeleton of moral absolutism, and now we're putting some flesh on the bones, or we're erecting uh, a building, an edifice upon the foundation, and so we've looked at the vices. And the vices are fascinating for a number of reasons. Perhaps my most, I think the most interesting or, or, or important reason is that the vices sort of reveal to us the kind of inner psychological struggles and uh, that we have, the issue in the various uh, heinous acts. Most of us never commit murder. Most of us never commit adultery, perhaps. Most of us never commit uh, rape. Most of us, uh, you know you know, aren't, aren't blatant thieves and liars and, and whatnot. But what the vices show is that the very same attitudes that produce the murderer, the rapist, the adulterer, the, uh, you know, major thief, those very same attitudes that produce them are quite often in us. The only reason they don't result in heinous acts is because perhaps we're afraid, we're too concerned with what, you know, we're concerned with what other people think, we're afraid of prison or death, uh, and so, so there are these external constraints that provide boundaries for the manifestation of our attitudes, right? They... They provide limits as to how these vice-like attitudes and habits of mind will be expressed in most of our lives. But we have the same sorts of tendencies, envy, vainglory, 
an avoidance of real intimacy and relationship uh, uh, with others and with God. So the vices are fascinating, and studying them can help us learn how to diagnose the problems in our own life, maybe in the life of others that we have the privilege of helping and, and advising. Uh, and so, so this study hopefully will make us and turn us into better people. Don't forget, if something is a vice, it is necessarily destructive of the person who has it. You cannot, the, the vices can never be good. Okay, now, if you think that one of the things on the seven deadly sins can sometimes be good, then you're just disagreeing that that thing is a vice. Okay, then you're saying that shouldn't be called a vice. That's fine. You're free to do that. I mean, you're free to do that provided you have good reasons for thinking so and whatnot. Um, but if something is truly a vice, it is destructive. An example that I gave another student earlier is... Uh, you know, if I, if I take a knife and stab my eye, that's destructive of vision. There's no way you can try to, you know, make that into something that is going to be good for vision or enhancing my vision. Or if you want a better example, I pluck out my eyeball and set it on fire or whatever, right? That's, that's destructive of vision. Okay, now you might say, look, maybe he needs to do that in order for him to hear better or something. I don't know. You can think of some crazy ailment or whatever. Fine, whatever. But it's destructive of vision. There's no getting around that. The vices are destructive of the person who has them. If it's a vice, it's destructive. No getting around. Okay, another thing that I want to talk about is this. Each one of the vices, I think, has the following implication. Or nature, it's part of the nature of the vice that it alienates us from God, it alienates us from others, and it alienates us from ourselves. So I'm going to give you just a, a, an example or two. Think of the vice of vainglory. The vice of vainglory, clearly it's an, it's an easy vice to think of in terms of alienation. The image that I project to the world with the vice of vainglory is not the real David. All right, so I present to the world this sweet, kind, patient, calm man, let's say. And so everyone thinks, oh, what a, what a sweet, patient, calm guy. What a great husband. He must be so patient with you and whatnot. So that's the image, let's pretend, that I project to the world. Well, in reality, I'm not very sweet, I'm not very kind, and I'm not very patient. Those are things that I really need to work on. Um... I'm not a calm person. I'm an intense person. All right, so I present this particular image to the world. It's not reflective of who I really am. So, obviously, there's going to be some alienation between me and others, right? Because others aren't going to know the real David. They're going to know this image of David. So, think about it like this. I deeply desire friendship. I deeply desire to be loved by others. And yet the thing that is loved is not me, but the image that I present to the world. That sucks. My deep desire can't be satisfied. Think about with God. The image that I portray to the world is the image that I portray to God. Right? The vainglorious person will be the person, right, who very quickly in the in the pro, you know, as vainglory sets in, right? As that person gets more and more vain, glorious in their attitudes and their behavior, they're even going to be presenting to God a false image of who they are, and so they're going to be alienated from God. And then as that vain glory, as those vain glory habits continue to work their way into the person, they will even be alienated from themselves. Because they won't even know, they'll become obscure to themselves. Surely this has happened to most of you. You've done something and you've thought, how could I have done such a thing? We are obscure to ourselves to varying degrees. The vainglorious person is obscure to him or herself uh, to a significantly high degree. Alienation from God, others, and self is uh, an, uh, a guaranteed implication of the vices. If you got the vice... You're going to be alienated from God, others, and self. Let's turn to lust. Aquinas says that lust is a disorder by reason of excess. 
regarding desires for sexual pleasures. Lust is a disorder by reason of excess regarding desires for sexual pleasures. So once again, lust is located in desire. It's an excessive desire for sexual pleasure. So every one of the vices basically has this feature. It's a disordered desire. It disorders our desires or our loves, our wants, and turns them on their head, right? The, the, the vices take things that should be lower in our hierarchy of loves, and it places them higher in our hierarchy of loves, thereby pushing down things that are supposed to be at the top of the list. So as the vices take over, my love for God, my love for my wife, my children, my neighbor, all of those things start diminishing and loves for other things start increasing. My love for food, my love for drink, my love for sexual pleasure, my love for attention, um, my love for the easy way, sloth, right? My love for comfort. Uh, and, and, and uh, uh, no, you know, no conflict or something like that. That's sloth, right? My love for, um, I don't know, for, for status, for power. All of those things start taking over and pushing my love for God. God gets removed from the center of my life. My, my love for family, neighbor gets moved from the center of my life and other things start taking over. That's what starts making me a monster, right? Think about, again, Breaking Bad. Walter White becomes a moral monster as various loves start taking over the center of his life. His wife, his family no longer occupy the center of his life. Okay, so the same thing is true of lust. What happens with lust is we have an excessive desire for sexual pleasure. And this is characterized by this internal desire, Aquinas calls it, the internal desire is disordered. Whenever the end is sexual pleasure, even when the external action is by reason of its species good. Okay, let me explain. So what Aquinas is going to do with lust is Aquinas wants to, to say that their lust um, manifests itself, let's say, in this internal desire, that's the primary location for lust, is in this internal desire. And Aquinas says, lust is present whenever the goal is sexual pleasure. Whenever the goal of the action is sexual pleasure. I'll talk about that in a minute. Lust is present whenever the goal is sexual pleasure. Okay. But Aquinas also is, it will say that uh, the acts of sex, there are some sexual acts that are wrong no matter what the goal is. So in this category, Aquinas is going to include adultery and rape. So think about it like this. No matter what the goal of the rapist, that action is always an impermissible action. You can't perform the act of rape and make it good by having a good intention, by having an okay goal, right? So suppose the rapist's goal is to, you know, become intimate and, and close to his victim, right? He really wants an intimate relationship. Well, that's a fine goal, right? Uh, doesn't matter. The act of rape is always wrong. So there are some sec sexual actions that are never permissible. Adultery, Aristotle, interestingly enough, Aristotle who predates Christianity by hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, Aristotle thinks adultery is always impermissible. It's never permissible to, to engage in adulterous behavior. Doesn't matter what your intentions are, that doesn't change it into an okay thing to do. Same with rape. Same with child molestation. Okay. So Aquinas thinks really it, the, the excessive desire for sexual pleasure manifests itself actually in this, that you that the, the, the person just wants sexual pleasure. That's the main goal. So think about this in terms of engaging in sex. 
when a person engages in sex, if all he or she is wanting to get out of it is sexual pleasure, there's a sense in which Aquinas and these others would say that's really no different than masturbation. It's really a masturbatory act. You're just using someone else's body as, or someone else's body parts, as a means to achieve an end that, that is all about you. It's all about satisfying your own sexual pleasures. And the idea is that's contrary to the nature of sex, because sex necessarily involves two persons coming together. And so when my goal or, or, or her goal is, the, is just simply sexual pleasure, I'm using the other person as a means to an end, as an instrument to satisfy my own desires, my own pleasure. Okay. Now, some would say it's not, it's not wrong to have sex with a husband or a wife for pleasure. And Aquinas would disagree. So, what's interesting here is that the tradition of the vices says that not only can lust occur in our hearts outside of marriage, but lust can and often does occur in our hearts inside of marriage. Similarly, wives... Husbands too, but since it's, it, this mo most often occurs with respect to uh, to women, uh, wives can be raped in marriage. A husband can rape a wife in marriage. Okay. So, here's one way of thinking about some of the stuff sort of floating around in your heads right now. Um, so suppose suppose right here. Suppose right here I've got this is this is Frank and here we have Steve. Okay? Frank is a serial killer. Steve is a serial killer. So both Frank and Steve are serial killers. Got it? Frank is a serial killer who looks like this. This is how Frank looks, okay? So if you can see my face, you know, it's grimacing Frank. He looks angry and upset. He's mean. Right? That's what this is this is this is Frank the serial killer. This is how he looks. Okay? Now let's here's Steve the serial killer. Steve is the smiling serial killer. Okay, so Steve looks like this. Got it? We've got Frank. Steve, both serial killers. So let me ask you this question. Which one is the more alarming, scary, freaky serial killer? Well, it seems to me that the answer is obvious. It's Steve, the grim, the smiling serial killer. And part of the reason why Steve is way scarier and freakier is because Steve is presenting himself as friendly, as nice, as welcoming, kind, nice, sweet, right? And yet the, the, the reality is that Steve is dangerous and wicked and evil. Frank is presenting himself to the world sort of as who he is. He's presenting himself as mean, as tough, as not to be messed with, as unkind, unfriendly, and that's precisely who he is. He's a serial killer. He's dangerous. He's terrible. So, Steve is more terrifying in part because the sign of the smile, a smile is a sign, it's a symbol that is supposed to indicate uh, the reality of friend friendliness, happiness, niceness. So, Steve has the sign without the reality. The sign and the reality have been taken away, have been separated. And whenever the sign and the reality are separated, there's something gross, something incongruous, nasty has taken place. And so what happens in sexual intercourse when the, the sign, sex, is separated from the reality, love, intimacy, a desire for union, for togetherness, that's supposed to be the, the reality that lurks behind the sign. Sexual intercourse is supposed to be the physical, visible manifestation 
of an invisible reality. So sexual intercourse is in 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 you know some deep sense, right? It's the closest that two human beings can get to one another physically. And that physical closeness is to represent a spiritual, emotional, mental closeness. And so when you don't have the reality or even, you know, the, or the desire for that reality, an inclination towards a movement towards spiritual, mental, emotional oneness. When that's not present, but you have the physical oneness, you have the sign separated from the reality, yuck. Steve is disgusting. And the idea is that physical, that sexual intercourse without emotional, spiritual, mental intercourse is also disgusting. Think of it like this. We have a word in our language that actually picks out sex, physical union, without spiritual union, and it's called the F word. Okay. All right, so in order to sort of unpack this more, I think what we really should do is spend a little bit of time thinking about the nature of love. So we're going to think about love in general and then try to think about romantic love in particular and I'll have an occasion to repeat some of the stuff that I just said in case you didn't get, get it in your notes. Love, according to Aquinas, Augustine, uh, lots of secular persons, atheists, have basically this sort of form of love. Love involves, let's say, three elements. Love involves appreciation, benevolence, and a striving for union. Love involves three things. This is all instances of love. Love for your friend, love for your children, love for your father, love for your husband or wife. All love relationships involve these three elements. Appreciation. This is basically, this is a near consensus within the philosophical community. Of course, people disagree about everything, right? People disagree about whether or not they have hands. Okay. So, love involves appreciation, benevolence, and a striving for union. Let's talk about those quickly. Appreciation, what is that? Well, appreciation is just grasping the value of something. Grasping its real value. Appreciation involves grasping its real, a, a thing's real value. Okay, got that? Think about it like this. I really, really, really value iced tea. Mm. Love iced tea. I also value my son. If I value iced tea more than my son, I have, a fail, I have failed to appreciate both the value of my son and the value of iced tea. I've inflated the value of iced tea. I've deflated the value of my son, thereby resulting in a lack of appreciation for both. So appreciation grasps the real value. If someone values their dog more than they value their child, they're not appreciating. They're not appreciating properly. Appreciation's gone out of whack. Okay. Love involves appreciation. Love involves benevolence. What is benevolence? Well, benevolence involves willing the good for the beloved. So I am benevolent towards you insofar as I desire your flourishing. I want you to flourish. And benevolence can involve two, really involves two parts, a general benevolence and a particular benevolence. General benevolence is just willing that you flourish. I really want you to flourish. I want you to succeed as humans. I want you to become well-functioning, uh, uh, good human beings. I want this for my wife. I want this for my children. I want it for you. That's a general benevolence. Particular benevolence involves me willing your particular goods. So let's say, according, let, let's say, and this is in keeping with the Christian tradition, let's say that the ultimate good for all persons is becoming united with God. Okay, that's the ultimate point. The ultimate goal for all of us is knowing God. Okay? That's the goal of our lives, according to the Christian tradition. Knowing God, being in a right relationship, a flourishing, healthy relationship with God. That's the goal. 
Okay, so if I love you, and that really is the the uh, the essence of living a meaningful, flourishing, good life, then I have to will that all of you become united to God, that all of you have a right, healthy relationship to God. That's what I will. That's what love would involve, okay? I wouldn't be loving you if I was if I willed that none of you have a relationship with God or if I if I if I willed that uh, the ultimate goal for your life was to make lots of money. Maybe I said, no, I want you to have a relationship with God, but I really, 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 my what I really desire for all of you is to make tons of money. I still wouldn't be but loving you because I'd be getting your flourishing. I wouldn't really be willing the ultimate good for you, okay? But now, particularly, each one of you uh, has different gifts, different features that will result in you having uh, a different kind of relationship with God. Now, this isn't some kind of goofy religious relativism where you all get to worship God however the heck you want, and you make up the rules for, you know, how you approach God. Some of you burn candles, some of you run around in circles singing, you know, Ring Around the Rosie or something, and all that's fine. No, 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 no. What this is saying is that the ultimate goal is to become united with God in a relationship with Him, but some of you have a gift of art. And some of you have giftings in mathematics. Some of you have giftings in singing. Some of you have giftings in, uh, my wife is a great photographer. And so to, tr to really love you in a particular way, in a way that is loving you and not just sort of your humanity in general, I also need to will that you flourish as an artist, that you flourish as a mathematician. Of course, I want all of that to be consistent with and an aid to you entering into a relationship with God. Okay, so benevolence involves desiring, wanting you to flourish as a human. It's it's willing the good for the other. That's what benevolence is, willing the good for the other. Striving for union, our third feature of love, striving for union. This is just what like it sounds. It's striving to become united to the beloved in various ways. So we can be united in mind. My wife and I uh, want to go see the same movie. And so in that sense, right, we're, we're united in mind, mentally united. Now suppose uh, she wants to go see the movie, you know, during the day, I want to go see it at night. She wants to go see it at one theater, I want to go see it at a different theater. So we're united in mind in one sense. We want to go see the same movie, but our wills and our in we're, are are sort of in conflict with one another. So in order for us to actually achieve our goal of seeing this movie, we need unity all the way down, right? We need unity in terms of when we see it, in terms of where we see it. it, it at least if we want to see the movie together. Okay, so. Striving for union involves, you know, uniting mentally, uniting in our minds, in our beliefs, in our will, our desires, at least our ultimate desires. So as my wife and I have grown in our relationship, I now, you know, and I know her better and better and better and better, right? Our beliefs have converged on all sorts of issues. We probably still disagree on some things. I know we disagree on some things, but on like the really important matters, We've got some unity in, 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 in our mind. We have unity in our will. My wife is, as I said, she's a, she's a phenomenal uh, photographer. And so I want her to flourish. I want her to develop those gifts. And so she wants that too. We are united in our will in terms of her flourishing as a photographer. And so I... I, in order to truly love her, I need to promote that gift in her. And all the time, you know, I need to be, you know, helping her see how this gift also aids her in loving me and loving others and in getting into a deeper love relationship with God. Now, the different types of love are distinguished most obviously in the types of union that is sought. So striving for union involves union of mind, union of, of will,
but it also involves union of body in, some, in, in, in most cases. We can call this the kind of external or, you know, a spatial unity, right? So I meet someone on Facebook, let's say we become really good friends, he's an interesting philosopher, and, you know, we're talking, we're talking. I really want to meet that guy. I want to hang out with him. I want to shake his hand, you know, maybe I want to have a meal with him, right? So the the striving for union in love involves a union in mind, a union in will, but it involves this kind of spatial or external unity. I want to be in their presence. I'm in I'm in Phoenix right now. My wife and I come to Phoenix every month This is or every year. This is where we were born, and I love, I'm so excited to become, to reunite with friends from my childhood and my teenage years. I'm so excited to see them again because I love them and love involves a striving for union. Mental striving for union, mind, will striving for union, as well as a, an external spatial striving for union. And the idea is that the different kinds of union separate the different kinds of love. So the kind of union between friends is different than the kind of union that is sought between a mother and a child, right? So I am not my child's friend uh, at this time in, in, in many of their lives. I'm still the union that we're seeking, the kind of love that we have as a parent-child love. Now, maybe one day, you know, as they get older and older and older and older, and we become more equal in terms of our contributions to the relationship, it will that 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 parental love will transform into the love of friends. Obviously, that's possible, and perhaps that's desirable. But right now, I'm not going to confuse my love relationship with my child as a love relationship between friends. It's quite different, and to confuse that would be to damage the parental love. Okay. Um, earlier in the in this course, I told you that you have to call me Dr. Alexander, Dr. A, Professor Alexander, whatever. You're not to refer to me as David. The reason is because you and I are in a particular type of love relationship. We're in a particular type of relationship. We're in a teacher-student relationship. And so I think that one of the best ways to mark off, to distinguish our relationship from other relationships in our lives is to call me by, by my professional name, Professor Alexander, whatever. And so that re reinforces in you and in me that this relationship is a special relationship. It's a teacher-student relationship, okay? With all of my students at Huntington, when they graduate, the students that I know well, when they graduate, I tell them all, please call me David. And the reason is I want to now mark off, highlight, signify that there's a change in the relationship. I am no longer your professor. I am no longer your teacher in that formal way. We have now exited that relationship teacher student relationship and I want to I want to uh, reinforce that we are entering into a new relationship and so you can call me by my first name we are now hopefully embarking upon a genuine friendship but teachers and students are not in terms of that at least that aspect of the relationship that that is not a friendship it's a different kind of relationship and I think it's important to mark that off with our language. Okay, how does this relate to lust? Well, romantic love is a different type of love than friendship love, brotherly love, parental love, teacher-student love. Romantic love is different. Romantic love essentially involves a striving for union, just like all the other loves involve a striving for union. But romantic love involves a striving for a particular type of union. It's a striving for sexual union. Friendship is not a striving for sexual union. 
Parental love is not a striving. It doesn't involve that kind of striving. So when you have two persons who are striving for, moving towards a sexual union, they're involved in a romantic love relationship. Now what happens in lust is that lust perverts the nature of love. Lust distorts love. In particular, lust distorts romantic love. So what happens, let's think about, so we're going to talk now about romantic love, remembering that romantic love involves <coughs> a particular type of striving for union, a striving for sexual union. But remember, it involves appreciation and it involves benevolence. You have to appreciate the being that you are striving for sexual union with. You have to, in order for this to be a genuine, real, deep type of love, you have to be benevolent towards them. You want them to flourish just as much as you want yourself to flourish, and so on and so forth, okay? What lust does is love perverts really all three of those aspects, or lust. Lust perverts all three of those aspects. It perverts appreciation, it perverts benevolence, and it perverts striving for union. Now, I think it most obviously perverts benevolence. Lust perverts benevolence because the lustful person is seeking their own sexual gratification, their own pleasure, and they're, they're in the moment, in that moment of lust, it could just be fleeting, right? I mean, you could be engaging in sexual activity with your partner, and, you know, it's love, then lust, love, then lust, love, then lust. That's certainly possible. That sucks, right, that, that we're that fickle and, and, and uh, uh, inconsistent in our desires, but that happens, okay? So, so uh, the, the lust most obviously involves a perversion of benevolence because in the moment of lust, you're not caring about the other person. You're thinking about you and your own gratification, your own sexual pleasure, okay? In the moment, maybe it's fleeting, but in the moment, it's about your sexual gratification. The most obvious case here is, is masturbation, right? Where it's, it's, it's just about you or those instances of rape that are really fueled by and motivated by sexual desire or, or sexual pleasure. I, of course, not all instances of rape are motivated by sexual pleasure, but sexual pleasure is involved, of course. All right. So clearly it's a perversion of benevolence because you're not striving after the good of the other. But it also will involve, so I think that's, Lust, if we wanted to characterize it, lust is a perversion of benevolence. So remember, we're talking about how does each one of the vices uh, pervert, distort, twist, tweak the good upon which it is based. Sexual pleasure is wonderful and fine and, and, and good to desire. Romantic love is beautiful and awesome. Lust perverts it, tweaks it. And in particular, I think it most obviously tweaks benevolence, this willing the good, desiring the good for the beloved. But it also tweaks appreciation. In the moment of lust, you're not valuing that person as a distinct individual, worthy of dignity and honor, uh, having immense value, made in God's image, just as valuable and wonderful as you. In the moments of lust, they are seen as a tool for your own gratification. And as a tool, they're really no different than a hammer or a shovel. Okay. And I also think striving for union gets perverted here, of course. Striving for union gets perverted because no union can be had. Right? I separate myself from the other when I just start focusing on me, and I'm only caring about my own gratification, and I, in that moment... I've ignored the gratification of the beloved. In that moment, there's no striving for union. There's only striving for David, for David's pleasure. So lust degrades sex by leaving the other person out of it altogether. The other person really becomes a means to my own gratification. Now, Christians need to watch out for over-spiritualizing sex to the point where we neglect the physical nature of it too. So we don't want to go in, you know, we don't want to just focus on the physical part of it. That's to leave out the spiritual, mental, emotional part of it. That's disgusting. That's the 
That's the smiling serial killer. The sign is present without the reality. Gross, 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 gross. That's really where we get the F word, right? Or that's what it, that used to signify sex without love. Okay. But we don't want to over-spiritualize our lives so that we lose the fact that we're embodied creatures and bodies become gross and nasty and disgusting and we're like ashamed of our bodies when we're naked with our lovers or something like that with our, with our wives or our husbands. So, you know, so, so we want to remember that the, the, this is a striving for union and it's a union of mind, a union of will, but it's a union of body. And notice, I mean, we strive for different types of bodily union. I can't wait to not, you know, so, so maybe let, let's pretend tonight I get to go see a friend I haven't seen in years. <laughs> what do you think I'm going to do when I first see that friend? Shake their hand and hug them. Right? We, we, we want bodily union and the different types of relationship uh, uh, are distinguished by the different types of union saw. Okay. So, man, lust is unbelievably fast. Love is unbelievably fascinating. At some point, I'd really love to teach an entire course on the philosophy of love and sex. Now, where do we find lust in the garden? Well, I think I think we, you know, th this is, I'm going to kind of, I don't think this is stretching it, but we're sort of, uh, uh, I, I don't know, well, whatever, whatever. Think about lust, think about the garden. In the garden, Adam and Eve were naked, then they clothed themselves. So nakedness is involved. Physical nakedness was a sign of spiritual nakedness. They were physically open with one another and God and themselves, and they were spiritually, mentally, emotionally open with one another, God and themselves. The fall occurs, right? Uh, the woman eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The man eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And automatically, all of a sudden, no more nakedness, no more openness. Now we're closed off to one another, right? And so we cover up, right? We hide behind. We're no longer naked emotionally, spiritually. So the physical nakedness was a sign of spiritual nakedness. In lust, that's what we have in a sense, right? In lust, we get physical nakedness and no spiritual nakedness, right? We get the sign without the reality. The goal is sexual pleasure. The goal is no longer genuine union with the beloved. And so I think in that sense, you can see sort of elements of lust in the garden scene in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. Lust has lots and lots of fruit, of course, right? So lust, some of the fruits of lust, if you are struggling with lust, here are some signs, right? <clears throat> pornography, obviously, if you're watching pornography, gentlemen, if you're watching pornography and struggling with it, feel free to contact me. I talk to uh, guys struggling with pornography regularly throughout the semester. Some of them I meet with weekly or even multiple times a week. I would love to talk to you. If you don't feel comfortable talking to me, no problem. I can point you in the direction of somebody else you might feel comfortable talking to. Ladies, if you're struggling with pornography, please talk to someone. Not me, but talk to someone, okay? My wife, you could perhaps talk to my wife. She's awesome. Uh, but there's lots of other women on campus who'd love to talk to you as well. But watch, you know, having some uh, porn issues... Is a, is a sign that you are well on your way to acquiring the vice of lust. Start seeing the other as an instrument of your own sexual gratification. Very dangerous. Uh, masturbation. If you're struggling with masturbation, this is a sign, right, that you are struggling with this, the vice of lust. You know, thinking of women or thinking of men overly sexually, right, sexualizing them regularly. Uh, would be a sign that you are struggling with the vice of lust. Now, for the Christian tradition, having premarital or extramarital sex is a sign that you are struggling with the vice of lust. Also, notice this. Lust, like all the other vices, has a natural trajectory. For most humans, it never gets there. We die before it actually develops into this. But lust, just like all the other ones, naturally leads, it's, 
Its paradigmatic expression is rape. And rape is the sort of most heinous masturbatory act a, a person could ever perform. Literally using another human's body as a means to my own sexual gratification. Utterly disgusting and terrible, and that's where all lust is, is moving towards. It will, it will not manifest itself in, in most persons. Lust will not manifest itself in most persons as rape. But that's where it's aiming if all barriers and constraints are taken away and lust is given time to mature in the life of the luster. Okay, got it? Uh, all sorts of ways of re uh, remedying this vice. One way of remedying this vice is, of course, uh, accountability. Um, and there's different ways of thinking about how to be accountable to each other or others. Um, you know, having apps on your phone or your devices that will alert others to the websites you're taking a look at. That's the kind of accountability. Meeting with other men or women um, to talk about these issues is, you know, if you're struggling with pornography, masturbation, things along those lines. By the way, the Christian tradition speaks pretty much in one voice in recognizing, at least throughout most of its history, that masturbation is uh, wrong because it's a manifestation of the vice of lust and continued masturbation will produce the vice of lust. Right? You, will, you will acquire this vice because you're clearly aimed towards sexual pleasure. Uh... Uh, other ways, um, you know, memorizing scripture that is relevant to combating lust. Um, lots of other, right, there, there's lots of other ways of combating lust. One of the ways, and I'm going to link to this on the website, one of the ways of combating lust, I think also, or at least combating pornography, one of the ways of doing this is to um, remember that sexual slavery, right? Women and, and, and men, boys and girls who are, who are in the sex trafficking industry, who are, who are being trafficked themselves, much of that is fueled by pornography. Much of that is paid for by pornography. A lot of the porn industry, that money is going into the sex trafficking industry. Lots of, lots of uh, data on this. If you're interested, I can send you some. I'll post a a music video that illustrates this in powerful ways. Um, I often cry when I watch the video. It's so powerful and good. Listen to the lyrics as you listen to the video. Another way is for men. This is a scripture verse from First First Timothy. Treat older women as you would your mother and treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. I can tell you if you think of all other women besides your wife or maybe your girlfriend, if you think of all other women as your mom right, or all other women as your sister, lust is going to diminish. Similarly, if you think of all other men as your father or as your brother, depending upon their age, lust is going to diminish. Okay, that's it for today.